Milling is the machining process of using rotary cutters to remove material from a workpiece advancing in a direction at an angle with the axis of the tool. It covers a wide variety of different operations and machines, on scales from small individual parts to large, heavy-duty gang milling operations. It is one of the most commonly used processes in industry and machine shops today for machining parts to precise sizes and shapes. Milling can be done with a wide range of machine tools. The original class of machine tools for milling was the milling machine. After the advent of computer numerical control, milling machines evolved into machining centers, generally classified as vertical machining centers and horizontal machining centers. The integration of milling into turning environments and of turning into milling environments, begun with live tooling for lathes and the occasional use of mills for turning operations, led to a new class of machine tools, multitasking machines, which are purpose-built to provide for a default machining strategy of using any combination of milling and turning within the same work envelope. Process Milling is a cutting process that uses a milling cutter to remove material from the surface of a workpiece. The milling cutter is a rotary cutting tool, often with multiple cutting points. As opposed to drilling, where the tool is advanced along its rotation axis, the cutter in milling is usually moved perpendicular to its axis so that cutting occurs on the circumference of the cutter. As the milling cutter enters the workpiece, the cutting edges of the tool repeatedly cut into and exit from the material, shaving off chips from the workpiece with each pass. The cutting action is sheer deformation. The metal is pushed off the workpiece in tiny clumps that hang together to more or less extent to form chips. This makes metal cutting a bit different from slicing softer materials with a blade. The milling process removes material by performing many separate, small cuts. This is accomplished by using a cutter with many teeth, spinning the cutter at high speed, or advancing the material through the cutter slowly. Most often it is some combination of these three approaches. The speeds and feeds used to vary to suit a combination of variables. The speed at which the piece advances through the cutter is called feed rate, or just feed. It is most often measured in length of material per full revolution of the cutter. There are two major classes of milling process. In face milling, the cutting action occurs primarily at the end corners of the milling cutter. Face milling is used to cut flat surfaces into the workpiece, or to cut flat bottomed cavities. In peripheral milling, the cutting action occurs primarily along the circumference of the cutter, so that the cross-section of the milled surface ends up receiving the shape of the cutter. In this case the blades of the cutter can be seen as scooping out material from the workpiece. Peripheral milling is well suited to the cutting of deep slots, threads, and gear teeth. Milling cutters Many different types of cutting tools are used in the milling process. Milling cutters such as end mills may have cutting surfaces across their entire end surface, so that they can be drilled into the workpiece. Milling cutters may also have extended cutting surfaces on their sides to allow for peripheral milling. Tools optimized for face milling tend to have only small cutters at their end corners. The cutting surfaces of a milling cutter are generally made of a hard and temperature resistant material, so that they wear slowly. A low-cost cutter may have surfaces made of high-speed steel. More expensive but slower wearing materials include cemented carbide. Thin film coatings may be applied to decrease friction or further increase hardness. They are cutting tools typically used in milling machines or machining centers to perform milling operations. They remove material by their movement within the machine or directly from the cutter's shape. Surface finish as material passes through the cutting area of a milling machine, the blades of the cutter take swarfs of material at regular intervals. Surfaces cut by the side of the cutter therefore always contain regular ridges. The distance between ridges and the height of the ridges depend on the feed rate, number of cutting surfaces, the cutter diameter. With a narrow cutter and rapid feed rate, these revolution ridges can be significant variations in the surface height. The face milling process can in principle produce very flat surfaces. However, in practice the result always shows visible trichoidal marks following the motion of points on the cutter's end face. These revolution marks give the characteristic finish of a face milled surface. 
revolution marks can have significant roughness depending on factors such as flatness of the cutter's end face and the degree of perpendicularity between the cutter's rotation axis and feed direction. Often a final pass with a slow feed rate is used to compensate for a poor milling setup, in order to reduce the roughness of revolution marks. In a precise face milling operation, the revolution marks will only be microscopic scratches due to imperfections in the cutting edge. Gang milling Gang milling refers to the use of two or more milling cutters mounted on the same arbor in a horizontal milling setup. All of the cutters may perform the same type of operation, or each cutter may perform a different type of operation. For example, if several work pieces need a slot, a flat surface, and an angular groove, a good method to cut these would be gang milling. All the completed work pieces would be the same, and milling time per piece would be minimized. Gang milling was especially important before the CNC era, because for duplicate part production, it was a substantial efficiency improvement over manual milling one feature at an operation, then changing machines to cut the next op. Today, CNC mills with automatic tool change and four or five axis control obviate gang milling practice to a large extent. Equipment Milling is performed with milling cutters attached to a milling machine. Types and nomenclature Mill orientation is the primary classification for milling machines. The two basic configurations are vertical and horizontal. However, there are alternate classifications according to method of control, size, purpose and power source. Mill orientation Watch video, vertical mill. In the vertical mill the spindle axis is vertically oriented. Milling cutters are held in the spindle and rotate on its axis. The spindle can generally be extended, allowing plunge cuts and drilling. There are two subcategories of vertical mills, the bed mill and the turret mill. A turret mill has a stationary spindle and the table is moved both perpendicular and parallel to the spindle axis to accomplish cutting. The most common example of this type is the bridge port, described below. Turret mills often have a quill which allows the milling cutter to be raised and lowered in a manner similar to a drill press. This type of machine provides two methods of cutting in the vertical direction, by raising or lowering the quill, and by moving the knee. In the bed mill, however, the table moves only perpendicular to the spindle's axis, while the spindle itself moves parallel to its own axis. Turret mills are generally considered by some to be more versatile of the two designs. However, turret mills are only practical as long as the machine remains relatively small. As machine size increases, moving the knee up and down requires considerable effort and it also becomes difficult to reach the quill feed handle. Therefore, larger milling machines are usually of the bed type. A third type also exists, a lighter machine, called a mill drill, which is a close relative of the vertical mill and quite popular with hobbyists. A mill drill is similar in basic configuration to a small drill press, but equipped with an XY table. They also typically use more powerful motors than a comparably sized drill press, with potentiometer controlled speed and generally have more heavy duty spindle bearings than a drill press to deal with the lateral loading on the spindle that is created by a milling operation. A mill drill also typically raises and lowers the entire head, including motor, often on a dovetailed vertical, where a drill press motor remains stationary, while the arbor raises and lowers within a driving collar. Other differences that separate a mill drill from a drill press may be a fine-tuning adjustment for the z-axis, a more precise depth stop, the capability to lock the x, y or z-axis, and often a system of tilting the head or the entire vertical to allow angled cutting. Aside from size and precision, the principal difference between these hobby-type machines and larger true vertical mills is that the x-y table is at a fixed elevation. The z-axis is controlled in basically the same fashion as drill press, where a larger vertical or knee mill has a vertically fixed milling head, and changes the x-y table elevation. As well, a mill drill often uses a standard drill press type Jacobs chuck, rather than an internally tapered arbor that accepts collets. These are frequently of lower quality than other types of machines, but still fill the hobby role well because they tend to be bench top machines with small footprints and modest price tags. Horizontal mill A horizontal mill has the same sort of Zao Euro Y table, but the cutters are mounted on a horizontal arbor across the table. 
Many horizontal mills also feature a built-in rotary table that allows milling at various angles. This feature is called a universal table. While end mills and the other types of tools available to a vertical mill may be used in a horizontal mill, their real advantage lies in arbor-mounted cutters, called side and face mills, which have a cross-section rather like a circular saw, but are generally wider and smaller in diameter. Because the cutters have good support from the arbor and have a larger cross-sectional area than an end mill, quite heavy cuts can be taken enabling rapid material removal rates. These are used to mill grooves and slots. Plain mills are used to shape flat surfaces. Several cutters may be ganged together on the arbor to mill a complex shape of slots and planes. Special cutters can also cut grooves, bevels, radii, or indeed any section desired. These speciality cutters tend to be expensive. Simplex mills have one spindle, and duplex mills have two. It is also easier to cut gears on a horizontal mill. Some horizontal milling machines are equipped with a power takeoff provision on the table. This allows the table feed to be synchronized to a rotary fixture, enabling the milling of spiral features such as hypoid gears. Comparative merits the choice between vertical and horizontal spindle orientation in milling machine design usually hinges on the shape and size of a workpiece and the number of sides of the workpiece that require machining. Work in which the spindle's axial movement is normal to one plane, with an end mill as the cutter, lends itself to a vertical mill, where the operator can stand before the machine and have easy access to the cutting action by looking down upon it. Thus vertical mills are most favored for desinking work. Heavier and longer work pieces lend themselves to placement on the table of a horizontal mill. Prior to numerical control, horizontal milling machines evolved first, because they evolved by putting milling tables under lathe-like headstocks. Vertical mills appeared in subsequent decades, and accessories in the form of add-on heads to change horizontal mills to vertical mills have been commonly used. Even in the CNC era, a heavy workpiece needing machining on multiple sides lends itself to a horizontal machining center, while desinking lends itself to a vertical one. Alternate classifications, in addition to horizontal versus vertical, other distinctions are also important, variants. Bed mill this refers to any milling machine where the spindle is on a pendant that moves up and down to move the cutter into the work, while the table sits on a stout bed that rests on the floor. These are generally more rigid than a knee mill. Gantry mills can be included in this bed mill category. Box mill or column mill very basic hobbyist bench-mounted milling machines that feature a head riding up and down on a column or box way. C-frame mill these are larger, industrial production mills. They feature a knee and fixed spindle head that is only mobile vertically. They are typically much more powerful than a turret mill featuring a separate hydraulic motor for integral hydraulic power feeds in all directions, and a 20 to 50 horsepower motor. Backlash eliminators are almost always standard equipment. They use large NMTB40 or 50 tooling. The tables on C-frame mills are usually 18 inches by 68, or larger, to allow multiple parts to be machined at the same time. Floor mill these have a row of rotary tables, and a horizontal pendant spindle mounted on a set of tracks that runs parallel to the table row. These mills have predominantly been converted to CNC, but some can still be found under manual control. The spindle carriage moves to each individual table, performs the machining operations, and moves to the next table while the previous table is being set up for the next operation. And like other mills, floor mills have movable floor units. A crane drops massive rotary tables, XY tables, etc., into position for machining, allowing large and complex custom milling operations. Gantry mill the milling head rides over two rails which lie at each side of the work surface. Horizontal boring mill large, accurate bed horizontal mills that incorporate many features from various machine tools. They are predominantly used to create large manufacturing jigs, or to modify large, high precision parts. They have a spindle stroke of several feet, and many are equipped with a tail stock to perform very long boring operations without losing accuracy as the bore increases in depth. A typical bed is X and Y travel, 
and is between 3 and 4 feet square with a rotary table or a larger rectangle without a table. The pendant usually provides between 4 and 8 feet of vertical movement. Some mills have a large integral facing head. Right angle rotary tables and vertical milling attachments are available for further flexibility. Jig bore are vertical mills that are built to bore holes, and very light slot or face milling. They are typically bed mills with a long spindle throw. The beds are more accurate, and the hand wheels are graduated down to 0.0001 inches for precise hole placement. Knee mill or knee and column mill refers to any milling machine whose XY table rides up and down the column on a vertically adjustable knee. This includes bridge ports. Planar style mill large mills built in the same configuration as planers except with a milling spindle instead of a planing head. This term is growing dated as planers themselves are largely a thing of the past. Ram type mill This can refer to any mill that has a cutting head mounted on a sliding ram. The spindle can be oriented either vertically or horizontally. In practice most mills with rams also involve swiveling ability, whether or not it is called turret mounting. The bridge port configuration can be classified as a vertical head ram type mill. Van Norman specialized in ram type mills through most of the 20th century. Since the wide dissemination of CNC machines, ram type mills are still made in the bridge port configuration but the less common variations have died out, their work being done now by either bridge port form mills or machining centers. Turret mill more commonly referred to as bridge port type milling machines. The spindle can be aligned in many different positions for a very versatile, if somewhat less rigid machine. Alternate terminology, a milling machine is often called a mill by machinists. The archaic term miller was commonly used in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Since the 1960s there has developed an overlap of usage between the terms milling machine and machining center. NCCNC machining centers evolved from milling machines, which is why the terminology evolved gradually with considerable overlap that still persists. The distinction, when one is made, is that a machining center is a mill with features that pre-CNC mills never had, especially an automatic tool changer that includes a tool magazine and sometimes an automatic pallet changer. In typical usage, all machining centers are mills, but not all mills are machining centers. Only mills with ATCs are machining centers. Computer numerical control. Most CNC milling machines are computer-controlled vertical mills with the ability to move the spindle vertically along the z-axis. This extra degree of freedom permits their use in desinking, engraving applications, and 2.5D surfaces such as relief sculptures. When combined with the use of conical tools or a ball nose cutter, it also significantly improves milling precision without impacting speed, providing a cost efficient alternative to most flat surface hand engraving work. CNC machines can exist in virtually any of the forms of manual machinery, like horizontal mills. The most advanced CNC milling machines, the multi-axis machine, add two more axes in addition to the three normal axes. Horizontal milling machines also have a C or Q axis, allowing the horizontally mounted workpiece to be rotated, essentially allowing asymmetric and eccentric turning. The fifth axis controls the tilt of the tool itself. When all of these axes are used in conjunction with each other, extremely complicated geometries, even organic geometries such as a human head can be made with relative ease with these machines but the skill to program such geometries is beyond that of most operators. Therefore, five-axis milling machines are practically always programmed with CAM. The operating system of such machines is a closed-loop system and functions on feedback. These machines have developed from the basic NC machines. A computerized form of NC machines is known as CNC machines. A set of instructions is used to guide the machine for desired operations. Some very commonly used codes, which are used in the program are GOO, return tool to reference position. GO1, linear interpolation of tool. G21, dimensions and metric units. MO3 per meter 04, spindle start. M30, program end. Also, various other codes are used. A CNC machine is operated by a single operator called a programmer. 
This machine is capable of performing various operations automatically and economically. While reading this article, along with collecting other information about milling machines, it is crucial for one to understand the computerized form of such machines. With the declining price of computers and open source CNC software, the entry price of CNC machines has plummeted. Tooling, the accessories and cutting tools used on machine tools are referred to in aggregate by the mass noun tooling. There is a high degree of standardization of the tooling used with CNC milling machines, and a lesser degree with manual milling machines. To ease up the organization of the tooling in CNC production many companies use a tool management solution. Milling cutters for specific applications are held in various tooling configurations. CNC milling machines nearly always use SK, CAT, BT or HSK tooling. SK tooling is the most common in Europe, while CAT tooling, sometimes called V-flange tooling, is the oldest and probably most common type in the USA. CAT tooling was invented by Caterpillar Incorporated of Peoria, Illinois, in order to standardize the tooling used on their machinery. CAT tooling comes in a range of sizes designated as CAT 30, CAT 40, CAT 50, etc. The number refers to the Association for Manufacturing Technology, taper size of the tool. An improvement on CAT tooling is BT tooling, which looks similar and can easily be confused with CAT tooling. Like CAT tooling, BT tooling comes in a range of sizes and uses the same NMTB body taper. However, BT tooling is symmetrical about the spindle axis, which CAT tooling is not. This gives BT tooling greater stability and balance at high speeds. One other subtle difference between these two tool holders is the thread used to hold the pull stud. CAT tooling is all imperial thread and BT tooling is all metric thread. Note that this affects the pull stud only, it does not affect the tool that they can hold, both types of tooling are sold to accept both imperial and metric size tools. SK and HSK tooling, sometimes called hollow shank tooling, is much more common in Europe where it was invented than it is in the United States. It is claimed that HSK tooling is even better than BT tooling at high speeds. The holding mechanism for HSK tooling is placed within the body of the tool and, as spindle speed increases, it expands, gripping the tool more tightly with increasing spindle speed. There is no pull stud with this type of tooling. For manual milling machines, there is less standardization, because a greater plurality of formerly competing standards exist. New and larger manual machines usually use NMTB tooling. This tooling is somewhat similar to CAT tooling but requires a drawbar within the milling machine. Furthermore, there are a number of variations with NMTB tooling that make interchangeability troublesome. The older a machine, the greater the plurality of standards that may apply. However, two standards that have seen especially wide usage are the Morse No. 2 and the R8, whose prevalence was driven by the popularity of the mills built by Bridgeport Machines of Bridgeport, Connecticut. These mills so dominated the market for such a long time that Bridgeport is virtually synonymous with manual milling machine. Most of the machines that Bridgeport made between 1938 and 1965 used a Morse taper number 2, and from about 1965 onward most used an R8 taper. Accessories, Arbor Support, Stop Block, History, 1810s 1830s. Milling machines evolved from the practice of rotary filing a euro that is running a circular cutter with file-like teeth in the headstock of a lathe. Rotary filing and, later, true milling were developed to reduce time and effort spent hand filing. The full story of milling machine development may never be known, because much early development took place in individual shops where few records were kept for posterity. However, the broad outlines are known, as summarized below. From a history of technology viewpoint, it is clear that the naming of this new type of machining with the term milling was an extension from that word's earlier senses of processing materials by abrading them in some way. Rotary filing long predated milling. A rotary file by Jacques de Vaucanson, circa 1760, is well known. It is clear that milling machines as a distinct class of machine tool first appeared between 1814 and 1818. 
the centers of earliest development of true milling machines were two federal armories of the U.S. together with the various private armories and inside contractors that shared turnover of skilled workmen with them. Between 1912 and 1916, Joseph W. Rowe, a respected founding father of machine tool historians, credited Eli Whitney with producing the first true milling machine. By 1918, he considered it probably the first milling machine ever built a euro certainly the oldest now in existence, a euro. However, subsequent scholars, including Robert S. Woodbury and others, have improved upon Rowe's early version of the history and suggest that just as much credit a euro in fact, probably more a euro belongs to various other inventors, including Robert Johnson of Middletown, Connecticut. Captain John H. Hall of the Harpers Ferry Armory. Simeon North of the Staddle Hill Factory in Middletown. Roswell Lee of the Springfield Armory. And Thomas Blanchard. Peter Bader, citing Edward A. Batterson's article Eli Whitney and the Milling Machine, which was published in the Smithsonian Journal of History in 1966, exemplifies the dispelling of the great man image of Whitney by historians of technology working in the 1950s and 1960s. He quotes Batterson as concluding that there is no evidence that Whitney developed or used a true milling machine. Bader says, the so-called Whitney machine of 1818 seems actually to have been made after Whitney's death in 1825. Bader cites Batterson's suggestion that the first true milling machine was made not by Whitney, but by Robert Johnson of Middletown. The late teens of the 19th century were a pivotal time in the history of machine tools, as the period of 1814 to 1818 is also the period during which several contemporary pioneers were developing the planer, and as with the milling machine, the work being done in various shops was undocumented for various reasons. James Nesmith built a milling machine very advanced for its time between 1829 and 1831. It was tooled to mill the six sides of a hex nut that was mounted in a six-way indexing fixture. A milling machine built and used in the shop of Gay and Silver in the 1830s was influential because it employed a better method of vertical positioning than earlier machines. For example, Whitney's machine and others did not make provision for vertical travel of the knee. Evidently, the workflow assumption behind this was that the machine would be set up with shims, vice, etc. for a certain part design, and successive parts did not require vertical adjustment. This indicates that early thinking about milling machines was as production machines, not tool room machines. In these early years, milling was often viewed as only a roughing operation to be followed by finishing with a hand file. The idea of reducing hand filing was more important than replacing it. 1840s-1860 Some of the key men in milling machine development during this era included Frederick W. Howe, Francis A. Pratt, Alicia K. Root and others. The most successful milling machine designed to emerge during this era was the Lincoln Miller, which rather than being a specific make and model of machine tool is truly a family of tools built by various companies on a common configuration over several decades. It took its name from the first company to put one on the market, George S. Lincoln & Company, whose first one was built in 1855 for the Cold Armory. During this era there was a continued blind spot in milling machine design, as various designers failed to develop a truly simple and effective means of providing slide travel in all three of the archetypal milling axes. Vertical positioning ideas were either absent or underdeveloped. The Lincoln Miller's spindle could be raised and lowered, but the original idea behind its positioning was to be set up in position and then run, as opposed to being moved frequently while running. Like a turret lathe. It was a repetitive production machine, with each skilled setup followed by extensive fairly low skill operation. 1860s In 1861, Frederick W. Howe, while working for the Providence Tool Company, asked Joseph Brown of Brown and Sharp for a solution to the problem of milling spirals, such as the flutes of twist drills. These were usually filed by hand at the time. Brown designed a universal milling machine that, starting from its first sale in March 1862, was wildly successful. It solved the problem of three-axis travel much more elegantly than had been done in the past, and it allowed for the milling of spirals using an indexing head fed in coordination with the table feed. The term universal was applied to it because it was ready for any kind of work, 
including two-room work, and was not as limited in application as previous designs. Brown also developed and patented the design of formed milling cutters in which successive sharpenings of the teeth do not disturb the geometry of the form. The advances of the 1860s opened the floodgates and ushered in modern milling practice. 1870s to World War I. In these decades, Brown and Sharp and the Cincinnati Milling Machine Company dominated the milling machine field. However, hundreds of other firms also built milling machines at the time, and many were significant in various ways. Besides a wide variety of specialized production machines, the archetypal multipurpose milling machine of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was a heavy knee and column horizontal spindle design with power table feeds, indexing head, and a stout overarm to support the arbor. The evolution of machine design was driven not only by inventive spirit but also by the constant evolution of milling cutters that saw milestone after milestone from 1860 through World War I, World War I and interwar period, around the end of World War I. Machine tool control advanced in various ways that laid the groundwork for later CNC technology. The jig borer popularized the ideas of coordinate dimensioning. Working routinely intense as an everyday machine capability. And using the control to go straight from drawing to part, circumventing jig making. In 1920 the new tracer design of J.C. Shaw was applied to Keller tracer milling machines for die sinking via the three-dimensional copying of a template. This made de zinking faster and easier just as dies were in higher demand than ever before, and was very helpful for large steel dies such as those used to stamp sheets in automobile manufacturing. Such machines translated the tracer movements to input for servos that worked the machine lead screws or hydraulics. They also spurred the development of anti-backlash lead screw nuts. All of the above concepts were new in the 1920s but became routine in the NCCNC era. By the 1930s, incredibly large and advanced milling machines existed, such as the Cincinnati Hydrotel, that presaged today's CNC mills in every respect except for CNC control itself. Bridgeport Milling Machine, in 1936, Rudolf Bano conceived of a major improvement to the milling machine. His company commenced manufacturing a new knee and column vertical mill in 1938. This was the Bridgeport milling machine, often called a ram type or turret type mill because its head has sliding ram and rotating turret mounting. The machine became so popular that many other manufacturers created copies and variants. Furthermore, its name came to connote any such variant. The Bridgeport offered enduring advantages over previous models. It was small enough, light enough, and affordable enough to be a practical acquisition for even the smallest machine shop businesses, yet it was also smartly designed, versatile, well-built, and rigid. Its various directions of sliding and pivoting movement allowed the head to approach the work from any angle. The Bridgeport's design became the dominant form for manual milling machines used by several generations of small and medium enterprise machinists. By the 1980s an estimated quarter million Bridgeport milling machines had been built, and they are still being produced today. Watch video, 1940s-1970s, by 1940, automation via cams, such as in screw machines and automatic chuckers, had already been very well developed for decades. Beginning in the 1930s, ideas involving servo mechanisms had been in the air, but it was especially during and immediately after World War II that they began to germinate. These were soon combined with the emerging technology of digital computers. This technological development milieu, spanning from the immediate pre-Euro World War II period into the 1950s, was powered by the military capital expenditures that pursued contemporary advancements in the directing of gun and rocket artillery and in missile guidance euro other applications in which humans wished to control the kinematics dynamics of large machines quickly, precisely, and automatically. Sufficient and spending probably would not have happened within the machine tool industry alone. But it was for the latter applications that the will and ability to spend was available. Once the development was underway, it was eagerly applied to machine tool control in one of the many post-WWII instances of technology transfer. In 1952, numerical control reached a developmental stage of laboratory reality. 
The first NC machine tool was a Cincinnati hydrotel milling machine retrofitted with a scratch-built NC control unit. It was reported in Scientific American, just as another groundbreaking milling machine, the Brown and Sharp Universal, had been in 1862. During the 1950s, numerical control moved slowly from the laboratory into commercial service. For its first decade, it had rather limited impact outside of aerospace work. But during the 1960s and 1970s, NC evolved into CNC, data storage and input media evolved, computer processing power and memory capacity steadily increased, and NC and CNC machine tools gradually disseminated from an environment of huge corporations and mainly aerospace work to the level of medium-sized corporations and a wide variety of products. NC and CNC's drastic advancement of machine tool control deeply transformed the culture of manufacturing. The details have evolved immensely with every passing decade. 1980s present, computers and CNC machine tools continue to develop rapidly. The personal computer revolution has a great impact on this development. By the late 1980s small machine shops had desktop computers and CNC machine tools. Soon after hobbyists began obtaining CNC mills and lathes, manufacturers have started producing economically priced CNC's machines small enough to sit on a desktop which can cut its high-resolution materials softer than stainless steel. They can be used to make anything from jewelry to printed circuit boards to gun parts. See also, arbor milling, CNC router, cryo milling, milling cutter, multi-axis machining, Photochemical milling, printed circuit board milling, 3D printing, notes. References Milling machine example, http, www.formatmachinery.com slash wft-mil-cnc-universal-milling-machine, further reading, Hound Shell, David A., From the American System to Mass Production, 1800-1932. The Development of Manufacturing Technology in the United States, Baltimore, Maryland, Johns Hopkins University Press, ISBN A978-0-8018-2975-0, LCCNA 83016269 Rolt, LTC, A Short History of Machine Tools, Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA, MIT Press. OCLCA 250074A. Co edition published as Rolt, LTC, Tools for the Job, A Short History of Machine Tools, London, BT Batsford, LCCNA 65080822A.